This weekend, of course. Uh, well, uh, the space that we're in uh, has been rapidly changing uh, from a, a sort of multi-purpose co-working space, we call it a shared studio, uh, into something a bit more forward-facing. We're obviously at the a street front. Um, we have street-facing uh, facade on Sunset Boulevard of all the places, so we're starting to, uh, as the neighborhood's changing a bit, we're starting to acknowledge how we can face forward a little bit more. So uh, on September 12th, which is in about three weeks' time, we'll open our doors uh, to, uh, to the public uh, as, a, as a gallery for applied art. Um, the, the meeting point of art and design, uh, our first show is a ceramicist named Alex Reed. Um, and we'll try to embrace um, the places where art and design meet, I guess, across mediums. Uh, and then we'll have our studio in the back still, but um, uh, but yeah, this this sort of space that you maybe see uh, will will function as a as a as a gallery, for lack of a better word. Uh, when I lived in New York, it was uh, it, almost entirely graphic design and and and, and type design. Um, and when my partner and I moved out here about three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, um, we were confronted with space, um, physical space and mental space, uh, uh, in which we could sort of splay out a little bit and, and, and understand maybe some things that were adjacent to our practice, but not, but that we hadn't been able to exercise yet. Um, and so we sort of, uh, she comes from an interior design and furniture design background. She went to woodworking school and interior design school, among other things. So she and I started making some, some things together. Um, and whereas I'd been able to sort of like express some physicality in publications and books and things like this previously, never had we been able to make a bookshelf or uh, a bookend or, or a chair or a stool these other things uh, and so um, and we also had the space for it the actual um, domestic space for it whereas in New York uh, we had been sharing in a, a loft apartment so there was always sort of um, uh, there was always a bit more of a communal uh, aspect for better or for worse um, but this idea this there's, there's a very sort of residential life that one uh, can lead in Los Angeles uh, and uh, to embrace that is a really um, special thing so to build out one's own living space in the way that, in the way that we, we could from an, uh, not from a ground up place, but at least from a, a walls in kind of, kind of place. Uh, and then so, so yeah, so that's how Norma came to be. Um, and and we, we named the studio, uh, it's a different story, but Norm, that's how Norma came to be about three and a half years ago. Um, and then, uh, so Norma kind of acts as pretty much like a nights and weekends endeavor for the time being. We still both have a day job, myself in graphic design, uh, and type design, and Heidi in, uh, in interiors. Um, but uh, Norma is sort of the, will, be, will be the quiet curators of this new space, this gallery space, uh, which is called Marta. Um, and then, yeah, since 2010, I've been collaborating with the, the guys at Colophon in London. Um, and that started initially as almost like a placement, a, a sort of casual apprenticeship um, while I was in graduate school. Um, and the guys, even though they're a few years younger, the internet has this funny way of sort of masking uh, or making opaque those kinds of uh, maybe like traditional age-based relationships. And so uh, they were doing interesting work and I uh, wanted to be not in the States for, for a summer uh, in between years in graduate school. And uh, so I worked with them and drew my first typeface sort of um, uh, under the roof of their studio in, in Brighton at the time. Uh, and that was called Raisonne, uh, and that was the, the typeface that ended up being the, um, the sort of building block of my catalog Raisonne for graduate school. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I probably, it's a, it's a very unsteady clip of about um, maybe publishing one typeface every two years or so. Um, and then type design also factors into my graphic design practice uh, in a sort of more casual um, and project-specific way. Um, 
but kind of all the time, I generally have one or two uh, sort of type designs running in tandem that I'm trying to foster into a place of being realized uh, uh, commercially, for lack of a better word. Yeah. I I think I'm um, I think I'm always uh, sort of thinking about forms again for better or for worse. Sometimes it's almost like a source of of slight anxiety when I move into like spatial realm. But I'm always thinking of forms kind of in their their silhouettes and in, in their profiles or in their their axonometric views. So it's sort of it's it's funny because like the creation of, of furniture and objects sort of has <clears throat> kind of like a almost like a one to one relationship to type design in so much as I'll often design what the piece looks like from a really oversimplified place. If you're somehow able to look at a chair from directly on its side, you know what I mean? Which is obviously never where you're Never the vantage point from which you're seeing a chair, but uh, for example, but um, uh, but trying to think of these uh, of these things as, as forms first, um, as, as sort of oversimplified forms. Yes, and that was and that was Norma's first project. So that was the first project that Heidi and I worked on when we got to LA. And uh, Heidi had grown up with a pool. Uh, she's from here originally, so she's from uh, the valley. Um, uh, just up north a little bit, and um, she'd grown up with a pool, uh, as almost everyone in her neighborhood did. It was sort of, um, it was a bunch of housing made in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, and almost every house, modest house, uh, was built with a with pool in the backyard. Um, so it, it was almost a, it was interesting to, to meet someone who, I always, from the East Coast, I always associated pools with uh, with means, with money. Um, so it was interesting to meet people from LA who grew up with pools and who were just very, very normal people, uh, happily normal people. Uh, and so, uh, so yes, yeah, so she had grown up with, with this pool and then uh, we started looking at these old contractors books for pools and realized that there was um, uh, a sort of standardized language um, uh, not only in the shapes of the pools, but in what the pools were called. And that was another really fascinating thing, is that um, the kidney pool, for example, was known as the kidney throughout the industry. If you went to any pool manufacturer and said, I want the kidney, it was a, it was a clear shape. Uh, it, was, it was understood uh, to that contractor the, the form that you were after. So the connection of form and language um, in that specific industry was, was sort of fascinating to us. And so we made sure that when we, when we put out the publication, which is predominantly about the shape of the pools, we also made sure to include the language um, because that's, that's a huge part of it for, for me and, and, and consequently for us. Um, I think it has to. It has to do with the fact that I'm always getting sort of happily pulled in a number of different directions, and so I'm. I'm maybe again. I keep on using this phrase for better or for worse. I'm sort of um. Uh, yeah, never able to to sort of um, or rarely able to kind of like foster one thing through from beginning to end before I get sort of happily distracted by 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 something else along the way. Um, and often that thing is in an entirely different medium or, or different sort of, or demands sort of a different um, publication method, a different means of putting that thing out into the world. Um, um, it could be as simple as an, in, as an Instagram post, you know what I mean? But, but, but I keep on getting pulled in different, um, yeah, ha happily pulled in all these different directions, uh, which leads to uh, an overall sense of inefficiency but also a, a, an overall sense of, of contentedness and exploration uh, that, yeah, I don't know, it seems to satisfy, um, there's a through line between all these things, but, but, but they take really different forms. And um, uh, without making it too much about LA specifically, because obviously like um, it's not contingent on a location, but somehow, it feels very, um, I don't think that would be happening as regularly if, I, if we weren't where we are. Um, 
it's a city of, of um, like hyphenates, like people who call themselves, or, or slashes, right? A, a model slash actor slash uh, barista or, or something, right? Uh, they, they do a lot of things, um, and many of them do a lot of things well. Um, but it's it's a sort of it's a town of freelancers and free agents. Um, it's not a town of sort of people who hold one job for fifteen to thirty years or something like this. It's a town of uh, people who are really nimble and people who are really um, open to being I can't for better or for worse open to being distracted by something else that they find. Uh, intriguing or compelling or meaningful. Well, we always try to, um, it's sort of an outlier, but we always try to, Norma specifically, tries to participate in the, the art book fairs. Um, and so uh, Printed Matter, uh, which is a sort of uh, classic New York uh, not-for-profit institution, puts on a book fair in Los Angeles and New York each year, and they sort of become I mean, they're amazing things unto themselves, but they also kind of become places for reunions and places for catch-ups and, and, and meetings and, and sort of um, happy run-ins. Um, and so we always, I, I sort of, since maybe 2010 or so during graduate school, I've been participating in them in one form or another, sometimes as myself, sometimes um, as Colophon, uh, other times helping out other publishers uh, or designing books that they're putting out during that time. Uh, but when we got to LA, uh, it was just about two weeks before the LA Art Book Fair, um, and I had uh, said yes to participation and then been completely waylaid by a cross-country move and had almost forgotten that we were participating. Um, and that's when we put together pools, um, actually. Um, was for the, it launched during the, the LA Art Book Fair in 2016, or maybe 17, I don't recall. But um, but it was during that specific fair that we uh, that we started acknowledging kind of um, how interested we were in the infrastructure of people showing books uh, and, and presenting their wares to the public. We were almost as engaged by the titles as we were um, by the way people chose to display those titles, um, whether it was a, a little prop or whether someone sort of. Well, uh, showed all the spines out, um, uh, and that was their sort of back stock, um, or that people did the piles, um, uh, or whether people built sort of elaborate infrastructures, even people coming from Europe, coming from Asia, uh, yeah, making these sort of uh, uh, amazingly elaborate support systems for all their publications. So anyways, we became super fascinated by this, and at the same time, uh, we moved across the country with a huge collection of books, and we're trying to design um, bookshelves, which ended up becoming sort of a, one of the first pieces of furniture that Norma put together. Um, uh, but we started becoming just really fascinated by, by how we, could, we've, we started to use this phrase, how to live well with books. Um, uh, we love them, we take them in, in some form or another, probably every day, um, whether that's literally passing them and looking at their spines and and having the best of intentions about reading one of them or actually being able to crack one open. Um, but all these sort of um, supporting infrastructures that allow you to, to, to live well with those things. So everything from reading lights to uh, eyeglasses to a bookmark um, to bookends to, uh, uh, yeah, just, just all, all these sort of, um, uh, sort of prosthetics that allow you to, to kind of um, yeah, support your books, uh, 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 and so the the uh, the speculative bookmarkers project was sort of an extension of that. We did a we did an exhibition a couple years back called In Support of Books, which was a group show of bookends, which was sort of an early exercise in, in kind of the curatorial um, endeavors we've been we've been starting more earnestly now. Um, uh, so we did we did book book uh, bookends one year, and then uh, we thought bookmarks would be a really nice thing. So sort of focusing on uh, bookmark objects, almost uh, uh, ways to handsomely display and, and keep your keep your place um, as you go through these things. Yeah. I grew up in Connecticut, in central Connecticut. Uh, I lived for one year in the Virgin Islands. 
which was strange, but really, really pleasant. That was before college, uh, as we call it. Uh, I went to college in upstate New York uh, at a little, little school called Hamilton, uh, which is about 2,000 students. Uh, and it was a true sort of what they call like liberal arts education. You learn a little bit of a lot of things and you specialize in precisely none of them. Um, but I studied uh, uh, fine art uh, and, and writing there. Um, and so those, those two things sort of came together to, to form my understanding of graphic design, which is a term that literally wasn't brought up once during my undergraduate education. It wasn't sort of something that the school traded in. Um, uh, and from there, I went, to, uh, I went to work in New Hampshire for a few years, uh, and then I found myself in graduate school at Yale, and so I was back in Connecticut for three years there. Happily, it was, uh, it was, like a, it was a pretty amazing time, and there's just sort of um, intensive uh, 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 first year course that, that one can opt into that sort of simulates four years of graphic design undergraduate education in one year. And then you sort of start your master's program. So I did that uh, and, uh, and graduated from there in 2011. And there's a sort of almost like gravitational pull from that place to New York City. Um, it's about two hours away by train. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, so I sort of did that, that very easy migration to, to New York and I started teaching. Uh, at a couple different institutions down there. And that lasted about five years, and when I met my partner, she was sort of on her way towards thinking about moving back to Los Angeles where she had grown up. Um, and her parents are out here, and she's an only child, so she was sort of looking to, looking to get back to that. And we sort of collectively started feeling a little bit of angst towards New York. Um, it was before, Donald Trump, but um, but ultimately that was sort of like the nail in the coffin for New for New York for us. I don't know why, but it was this thing. So we left in uh, uh, early 2016. We arrived here in February, and then uh, and then later that year, sort of everything kind of went to went to hell, or sort of. Other people might argue differently, but but I, I feel like they went to hell, uh, and and then and then it was weird, and we sort of like felt like there was this like kind of dark. Um, cloud over New York, which is not fair to New Yorkers and not fair to New York because obviously it still thrives and does great things as a city and I'm, we're overjoyed every time we have a chance to go back. But it's strange feeling it from afar. There's very little, um, almost, almost interest, which feels sort of rude to say, but I, I have very little interest in New York right now. I don't know why. But I think part of that is because Los Angeles is... Um, it's just very satisfying, uh, personally, professionally, infrastructurally, culturally. It has, it acts as a really interesting foil to New York, almost like a yin and yang. Um, there's a reason that they're kind of like sister cities, but, um, but they, I, I feel like they fill in each other's gaps. They offer things that the other one sim like almost simply does not in some cases. I'll make it just like very, um, very real world in a way, um, uh, uh, because there's a, there's a couple like ways that I have come to measure their differences. Uh, the first is kind of like having um, an agency of mobility here, um, and that has to do with the automobile, uh, which obviously there are uh, <laughs> systematic and environmental issues with. Uh, the automobile, it would be foolish not to not to say that, uh, or not to acknowledge that. But the automobile also, it offers this this like really dumb American freedom of being able to pick up and go when you want and how you want. Um, you almost had to plan spontaneity in New York. If you wanted to get away, you had to book a train ticket, or book a flight, um, and you had to really sort of several weeks or months in advance kind of plan to escape. Um, and having the, the sort of freedom of being able to wake up on a given day and say, that I, would like to go, I would like to go somewhere. Um, uh, having an automobile 
here in Los Angeles sort of um, it encourages that sort of exploration or or freedom, and it's it's so uh, it's so, so sort of like I'm like strangely patriotic about it. This like this funny uh, like the car is such a such a I don't know, I view it as such an American thing, right? This sort of like Midwest Fordist um, uh, thing. But damn if I don't love a car. Like I, lo I love a car ride. I love like listening to music in a car with the windows open. Um, it sounds so hokey uh, and trite, but there's a reason it's so satisfying, I think. Um, and anyways, the car, the car ends up to me being like a really interesting not direct metaphor, but, but sort of a, a means of metaphor about speaking about the, the city at large, is, is that it's one that's just a, a little bit more um, open and accessible. And it's sort of, the way I sometimes describe it is that, is that LA uh, is, is just like, like this, sort of. It's, it's uh, horizontal, and New York is quite vertical. And I think that comes along sort of with an, un, like a, like a subconscious um, um, like predilection towards hierarchy. In New York, it feels like a ladder. It feels like a, a, a thing that you need to sort of climb up um, uh, and, and almost fight, fight people who are on a similar level in order to somehow advance or, or something like this. And I just don't feel any of that here. Los Angeles has this sort of um, this democracy to its landscape that sort of um even having a studio on the ground floor like this this would be unheard of in new york um and it was a, a promise to myself that i would never have to use an intercom again right like i would never have to ha have someone buzz up and say like i'm here and then i would say oh, like up up four flights uh take a left take another right my studio's at the end of the hallway or something like this um, and so it was almost like a, a resolution to have a space, a studio space when we got here that someone could literally like walk by and knock on the window and say like, stop working, uh, or like, come get a drink or any of these sorts of things. So even that, that ability of being at, at street level, which is a far more sort of European thing, if I, if I might say so, like LA is not really thought of as being a, a, a city that's European in its outlook, but there is something about being uh, sort of more on the ground um, and more uh, at street level that that rings really true to me.